and we'll set our motivation. May all sentient beings possess happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings not be separated from happiness that is free of suffering. May they abide with equanimity, free from attachment, hatred, and indifference. So sitting with that, And so today we'll review last Wednesday briefly, and then we'll continue on with compassion. So first of all, we have just bodhicitta. There was a sneak peek of the definition there, but can you tell me what you think bodhicitta is? <laughs> just, I know we talk about it constantly, but I just wanna hear how you describe it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be technical, just, Tell me what you think bodhicitta is. A person who decided to take a, a mission to help every person, every human, every creature uh, to the level of to his uh, Buddhahood. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. That's one piece. Yeah. Exactly. Take the suffering of everybody along this way. Yeah, there are elements of that for sure. Yep. That's one piece. What's what? What do you think is the other piece of bodhicitta? That that was beautifully said. Thank you. To be enlightened. No. Yeah, to be enlightened. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I I think that you all understand, and then the question becomes: After you understand, do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you find something in the middle that works for you? What is your relationship to this word? The the idea that we have to become enlightened and in becoming enlightened that's the best way to benefit sentient beings and to benefit sentient beings is to help them become enlightened as well so it's the main mahayana motivation it's the main motivation what is your relationship with this word now that we've been talking about it for some time i think yeah it's the way because you are all a, you, with wisdom and also with great compassion so we help others. Yep. Yeah, I missed a couple of words just because of the oh. audio. Um, do you feel like um, like this orientation is a practical orientation? That if you have this very big picture in your mind, then all of the little small things in your life are in a good perspective or have a good coloring to them? that somehow framing your life with a very big idea is a good idea? Or do you think there's something maybe problematic that could happen? For me, it's a good idea. <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> you know, I want you to say that, but um, I think that, that it's always useful to ask, is there ever any disadvantage? And of course, when we say Buddhahood, we're talking about a type of perfection and to aim for perfection all day, every day, could sound like a terrible idea. You're setting yourself up for failure. You know, like people aren't perfect. Trying to be perfect is gonna make you feel disappointed and deflated and all these things. So, you know, the, the, the thing that we're really looking at is a baseline assumption that our mistakes and our ignorance are not fundamental to our character that they are not us, that they are removable. They're just symptoms of ignorance and suffering. And so in working towards this perfection, what we're really doing is just clearing the mistakes and then developing the qualities. And that being in process is part of what makes life rich and what it makes it have meaning and purpose and as long as we're being very honest with ourselves that despite wishing for our fullest potential, we get distracted or we have contaminated motivations, as long as we acknowledge that, it's moving in the right direction. The other problem is thinking by aiming for enlightenment, 
I can assume that all of my motivations are pure, <laughs> which is not true, of course. But sometimes we can get that idea too, that we have a baseline assumption that we want to help people. And we assume that everything we do is because we want to help people because that is our worldview, that is our core value. However, despite that being a truth in our mind, doesn't mean it's active and awake in our mind every day. So we could be acting from very clear self-cherishing, but telling ourselves that it's altruism. So that kind of like really radical honesty is so important. Oh. <laughs> bell. So um, in the class that you watched on Wednesday, we went through some of the processes for developing bodhicitta. And there were two main strategies that are the traditional strategies. One is like the gratitude catalyst of recognizing all sentient beings as having been your mother, remembering their kindness, wishing to repay their kindness like that. Gratitude catalyst. And the other was the logic catalyst that you did as a meditation, which was equalizing and exchanging self for others. So these are the two main methods to develop bodhicitta. Whether they work for you or not, what is your sense of ways of building on your core value of wanting to have more altruism in your life and less self-cherishing in your life? What are the thoughts? that you need to have in your mind to contradict the old patterns of self-centeredness. Whether it's those traditional st strategies or not, how do you tell yourself <laughs> to stop being so selfish when selfishness feels like an essential protection or something silly like it does on a bad day when you're in a bad mood? Me first feels essential. Me first feels practical me first feels like protection and then you get closed-minded and narrow on those days how do you talk yourself out of it or feel your way out of it or release that trap what are the things that you do internally at least we can if i can feel that it's make me more to suffer when i'm in this position i feel it yeah yeah, you remember that it's painful to live in that space. Yeah. I, I just, I, I not just remember, I feel it. Yeah. Painful. So it's helped me to try to go to another position to think yeah. or read or... Yeah, to, to shift it mm -hmm. or to release it. Yeah. Also, yeah, that's a good strategy. Yeah, what else? Uh, remembering the big picture. Yes. Uh, when you are uh, inside a very, uh, like you said, narrow vision or experience to remember the, the big perspective, uh, uh, also uh, time perspective. and. Uh, mm. Yeah, that's really skillful, right? To It's not just the big picture in terms of all of humanity and all of the things in life, but also the big picture in terms of time, as you said, that this will change, could get better, could get worse, but definitely it will change. <laughs> and um, kind of the, the tension we feel with our bad mood sometimes is that we forget impermanence. We think, oh no, now this is how I'm going to feel. So now I have to make a strategy for the whole day to fix this feeling because this is just how I'm going to be now unless I do something about it. But often, if you just notice the mood and notice the narrow focus, that noticing sometimes is enough to kind of let it release or watching it is enough for it to kind of run out of gas. Often these things last longer, <laughs> the more resistance we have. So it's this really interesting tension of understanding that we don't want to live in a very coarse self-cherishing motivation, but having resistance to the fact that we're feeling it in the present moment can be problematic. So you want it to move on, but you're not forcing it to move on. 
you want the bad mood to shift so you're bringing observation to it which is really like an act of kindness towards yourself of bearing witness to your own struggle and just kind of holding that of wow i'm really suffering right now i have grumpiness i have closed-mindedness i am resenting people that is suffering that is happening and just holding that is not the same thing as trying to force it out it's not having resistance but it is still encouraging it to shift. So these kind of inner conversations, I think are really important so that we can catch it as small as possible, because the smaller we can catch the mood, the easier it is to shift it. Any, yeah, any other thoughts about how to open the mind up again or open the heart up again when you feel it closing? Or if you feel it closing specifically, like with a patient in the session, you know, you start open, altruistic, good listening, and then they say something that triggers you and you kind of can feel your heart harden a little bit. And you're still staying professional and you're still staying very kind, but you can feel your heart kind of closing. How do you open it up again? I to put myself in, in their shoes. Mm. Yeah, you shift, you shift into who you're thinking of. Yeah. That's a quick way. That's a good way. Yeah. Yeah. What, anything else that kind of comes to mind? Or do you just kind of let it pass because you know it will pass? Or what, what do you say to yourself when you know that your inner responses are not what you wish they were. Maybe I think about emptiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, remembering emptiness helps really quickly. Um, and it's interesting because as you guys know, in Buddhism, there are so many antidotes to negative states of mind. But some of those antidotes have to be very well timed. Otherwise, they can become part of the problem. For example, when you're very angry, an angry mind often has a lot of words. It's very analytical. It's trying to remind yourself why being angry is good and appropriate and only fair. And you go through many lists. And then if you try and bring in a different list, like why love is good, why patience is good, sometimes your angry analytical mind will take those words and kind of like distort them and create a whole story about why, sure, I should be patient sometimes, but in this instance, with this person who is horrible, no, and all these reasons. But if you remember emptiness, there's usually not a bad time if you've understood it accurately. Emptiness is less likely to trigger a negative analytical mind. It's much more likely to just kind of take the air out from the affliction yeah to kind of like steal the food of the problem because it's like everything that the negative state of mind is resting on is nonsense <laughs> and so emptiness just kind of like pops the bubble of it so that can be a really quick one so emptiness is a good go-to for any negative state of mind and whether you're remembering the emptiness of yourself or the person or the interaction or all of it, it can really settle you very quickly. Yeah. Even, and this is before we even have any kind of realization. It's just a good understanding of emptiness it has enough power to do that, but it has to be an accurate understanding. Okay, so I'll go into the review. So bodhicitta, sometimes the mind of enlightenment sometimes the heart of enlightenment, sometimes the spirit of enlightenment, depending on your translator, the main Mahayana motivation, the altruistic mind that seeks enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. Okay, so we have the gratitude catalyst, which is called the sevenfold cause and effect, or sometimes called the six cause and one effect. And all of these methods rely on first having equanimity. So these are building on equanimity. 
And so with recognizing all sentient beings as mother, this is the kind of the hardest one to prove logically. And then once you do, the rest of them are easier. So, so I know there was a question about this um, that we're going to talk about in meeting the Dharma, so we'll come back to it. But the short, um, I guess just the short thing to sit with, and you can take it or leave it, is the idea that time is beginningless. Okay, time is beginningless. The universe expands and contracts and expands and contracts, just like science describes, right? Science used to believe that there was the Big Bang, and now they know that there have been many Big Bangs, right? So if you're reading Stephen Hawking's or something like this, you understand that those two worldviews go together very well. So form and matter take on different aspects over time. Sometimes there's a lot of coarse form and matter, sometimes there's not. Sometimes sentient beings have bodies, sometimes they have bodies in the nature of light or wind, chi, energy. So remember that when we talk about all sentient beings, we're not talking about Earth. There are more planets that have life than Earth from a Buddhist perspective. And we talk about kind of like, the four or five main ones in this universe when discussing sentient life, um, kind of the nearest planets with life. So, you know, Buddhists believe in aliens, okay? <laughs> and the aliens are not um, like fundamentally different than ourselves. They have consciousness, they have innate ignorance, they have Buddha nature, just like us. And we have been them and they have been us. So this is the, the one of the views, right? So you have time is beginningless. The universe is full of sentience. The sentience takes form and doesn't take form at various times, or um, I guess should I should say is associated with form at certain times. And sentient beings are finite in that there are no new ones because the substantial cause for mind can only be a previous moment of mind because a substantial cause has to be similar to the result. Cause and effect have to be related. So a fundamental Buddhist view is that there is nothing that comes from nothing, right? Everything has a cause. Yeah, everything has a cause. Things don't just come about out of nowhere. So to say a new sentient being would be like saying something popping out of nowhere with no cause of a similar type to it. So the idea is that, you know, sentient beings are cycling through various realms, not necessarily in a tidy upward evolution, but cycling and cycling. And sometimes we're humans and sometimes we're insects. Sometimes we're on other planets. Sometimes we're formless but we believe in the science of evolution on planet earth no problem it's just that within the evolution of sentient beings on planet earth our minds enter into various bodies sometimes animal ones sometimes human ones etc so the fact that there are more people is not a problem for this logic because they may have, those minds may have come from elsewhere. And some of the old minds, old minds, previous humans go elsewhere. So it's not confined to one planet. So anyway, sit with this and then bring it up again at meeting the Dharma if you're still having lingering issues. But what we're trying to say is that because time is beginningless, but sentient beings have a finite number, the probabilities are you run into each other multiple times in multiple relationships. We choose the mother dynamic because it's the closest thing we have to unconditional love in our experience that's remembered as a human being. That's not pervasively true, obviously, but the idea that at some point in our life we were so vulnerable that we would have died without her brings up a sense of gratitude. 
And the whole point of the conversation is, how can I have gratitude towards sentient beings? And not a sense of like owing them, like owing them money, not like that, but a sense of just like a rich gratitude that acknowledges the benefit of sentient beings. That's the basis of this argument, the basis of this meditation. So whether you believe all sentient beings have been your mother or not, you can put to one side, or you can think of epigenetics or ancestral trauma or ancestral wisdom, if that helps you. Or you can just think of the infinite interconnectedness of all living beings. But what you're trying to do is ask yourself, how can I subdue my self-cherishing and my pride that thinks all the good things in my life are my own creation? Because they're not. Everything you like about yourself is learned. Every form of resiliency was born from interaction. So if you can really somehow touch, I really am who I am, the best parts of who I am because of others. It's a learning, it's an interaction, it's a collaboration. And anything I like about myself is learned. Whether learned from mother or learned in general doesn't really matter at the end of the day. But what you're trying to evoke is a sense of thank you. Whenever you meet any single sentient being, that one of your first thoughts is thank you. And then may I repay the kindness, whether it's a kindness I've seen or not. Does that make sense? So if the vision is gratitude and thank you, then wanting to repay the kindness of sentient beings flows very naturally. And you ask yourself, what would it be to repay the kindness? It would be to offer them the conditions for happiness and the conditions to be free of suffering. So it moves you into love and compassion and those build into a strength that turns into great compassion, the highest intention, which is no longer passively wishing them happiness and freedom from suffering, but is actively taking responsibility to bring that about. And that great compassion that has personal responsibility with it turns into bodhicitta. So that's the effect of those thoughts. So I'll put that up again and you can just have a look. And again, you don't have to buy into this worldview at all, but it might be helpful to look at certain pieces of it and see how they resonate. So you recognize all sentient beings as having been your mother because finite sentient beings beginning with time. Then you think of their kindness by remembering the kindness of mothers in general and your own mother in this life, which then has this gratitude that wants to repay, turns into loving kindness, compassion, bodhicitta. So having gratitude be the catalyst can be very triggering for some people. Some people have a lot of reactivity when they hear anything that feels like I owe anybody anything. It triggers their sense of independence. Um, our rugged individualism in the United States, for example, is very challenged by the idea that we should be grateful to anyone. It, it feels like now we're giving up power. Yeah, so it can be, we can get reactive because it feels like gratitude is giving up power and positioning, and it's making us too humble. So some people really don't like this argument. But I think the way into it is to try and remember some time in your life where you had a natural, free-flowing gratitude and the kind of warm, abundant feeling it gave you. And then when you went to benefit others, the way it was flowing very freely and didn't feel like an effort that cost you anything. You know, that feeling of like, oh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. I really needed that. You know, sometime when maybe it's when a stranger has been kind to you for no reason that didn't benefit them at all. And just that like deep gratitude you feel when a stranger has been kind to you when you have felt vulnerable. And then the rest of the day, 
you're a little softer and kinder to others very naturally because it touched something in you that someone was so kind. So anyway, there's a lot of ways to work with if you're feeling reactive to the idea of gratitude, but I think the idea of gratitude can be very enriching and very helpful for developing an altruistic intention, whether secular or religious, depending on your view. So if it doesn't work for you, then there's a whole other strategy, which is the um, logic catalyst. And the logic catalyst has less involvement with belief in past lives. So again, the foundation is equanimity. And here we recognize all sentient beings are equal in wanting happiness and not wanting suffering and in many other ways. And then the logic of numbers is to help us kind of get rid of the self-cherishing false logic. We are one, others are many. Therefore, putting all the attention on one is too much attention. And then we think of the disadvantages of self-cherishing, the advantages of cherishing others, and we decide it only it makes sense to exchange them. And then you do the actual exchange with Tonglen. So do you guys have any, any thoughts about those two methodologies or questions? And you'll talk about it more with your AL next semester, I think, but um, they'll keep coming up. So it's good to kind of get used to the framework and ask yourself, where do you get stuck or where do you get inspired? So far, are there places where you get stuck or places where you get inspired? Sometimes it might be only one of the points. Yeah, the rest of them are like, oh yeah, okay. But one of them somehow really resonates. Thoughts are brewing? Okay. Um, bring it up again during meeting the Dharma if something occurs to you. So then we'll move from bodhicitta in general to the six perfections specifically on Wednesday. And particularly you'll be looking at patience but basically just a reminder, we've had this in our retreats, but just remember that a perfection or a paramita, these six perfections are aspirations and activities directed towards achieving Buddhahood. So someone with uncontrived bodhicitta is called a bodhisattva. So the reason I say this is because the six perfections, generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, wisdom, on their own are qualities that are not religious or spiritual qualities. They're just good things to live by that make sense on many levels. But the perfection of these is something very specific. So don't, you know, don't kind of make it too ordinary. When we're talking about patience on Wednesdays, starting this Wednesday, we're not talking about a general patience. We're talking about the perfection of patience which means it's qualified by, it's imbued with the intention to become enlightened. And part of moving towards enlightenment is carrying patience with it, like that. So it's not just kind of a, a general secular set of good qualities, even though that's wonderful in and of itself, we're talking about perfections. Okay, and then you guys started reading chapter 12 and hopefully you finish chapter 12 soon. And then reviewing from last week, um, the idea that in Buddhism, renunciation is the determination to be free from samsara. This is, this is self-compassion, okay? Self-compassion is wanting to be free from samsara. This is a very interesting and intriguing point. Whether you believe in samsara or not, you definitely believe in repetitive negative thinking and bad habits that we all have. The kindest thing is to give ourselves freedom from negative habits. So the best act of self-care, compassion and kindness towards oneself would be to remove our suffering and the causes of suffering. So this is having the long view that works on both method and wisdom 
and T emphasizes samsara symptoms relief by going to the root of suffering, which is grasping at the self. So we so could say the best act of self care is to meditate on emptiness or to meditate on bodhicitta. It's the nicest thing you can do for yourself. And then it's going to have the side effect of being of benefit to everyone in your life because your development makes you a lot more beneficial to be with. So this idea of self-compassion in Buddhism is not ordinary, but the ordinary things are okay. It's not like you're not allowed to do the ordinary things, but there's something very interesting to look at in terms of our negative habits that we call self-compassion. For example, like not eating healthy enough. So not eating healthy, not taking care of our body, not making sure that we're as healthy as we can be from a Buddhist perspective is self cherishing negative self cherishing that kind of indulgence. Because you're saying it's okay if i'm not at my best because it's just me and my life anyway it's just for me and i'm coping fine. But if you're working for the welfare of others, you want to be at your best, you want to be at your healthiest and your strongest. So for the sake of all sentient beings, you eat healthy and you look after yourself and you get enough sleep and you pace your schedule in a way that's sustainable and you, you know, come into interaction with things that are healthy for your mind. For others, so if you have less self cherishing, you might actually look after yourself better. Does that make sense? Because self cherishing says it's just about me and my life. So if it's just about you and your life, you can do what you want for your body, for your mind. You can watch Netflix all day. You can eat nothing but chocolate. It's just you. You'll survive. But if you're working for others, you have to be healthy mentally and physically. So then you take care of yourself very well. Questions or thoughts about that? Is it clear? Uh, interesting that uh, we are taking care of ourselves better when it's for the other. So it's win-win, <laughs> right? It's win-win. It's not very uh, interesting to take care of yourself um, just uh, for yourself. It's not um, enough, um, doesn't give enough uh, motivation. Yeah. Uh, boring at uh, at some level yeah exactly it's it's easy to say oh it's good enough if it's just for you lots of things you know my level of study my level of kindness my level of health my level of whatever it's fine whatever it doesn't matter it's easy to be a little lazy if it's just for you yeah you're right it gives so much more motivation to say but for others i need to be stronger so I need to look after myself to become strong or to stay strong. And it's, it's an important part of this long view, big picture, deep picture mentality that we keep going back to is if the purpose of our life is to work for the welfare of all sentient beings, we have to be able to have a sustainable pace and a sustainable pace is more joyful for you as an individual. So, you know, there's a lot of quotes from a lot of, of scriptures, it's Shantideva, Nagarjuna, all sorts of things saying the root of all of your own suffering is self cherishing. The root of all of your own happiness is cherishing others, which is completely counterintuitive to what self cherishing says you need. Self cherishing keeps saying, me first, me first. But if you're in me first all day, you know how miserable it is. And you also know how kind of joyful and expansive you feel on those days when you're really thinking of the welfare of others, but in a not a tight attached way that has to have the goals enacted, you know, the immediate goals or the superficial worldly goals. You don't have to see proof of the success of your altruism. You're just an open-ended, no expectation altruism. 
with the long view. Those days are very happy days. As soon as you think, because of my altruism, I shall make people happy, like forcefully, immediately, today, then it's gotten trapped by attachment and you've ruined it for everyone, including yourself. But when it's open-ended, non-attached altruism, these are the happiest days of our life. So we have to remember that self-cherishing lies. It lies. And the basis of the lie is self-grasping. We have innate self-grasping, which views the self as inherently existent. So of course, self-cherishing makes sense to that view. Yeah, so these are the twin demons. We keep coming back to these twin demons, self-cherishing, self-grasping. So then compassion for others helps them with their renunciation. So we're not reinforcing their samsara with the ways that we help them. And so then we have to ask ourselves, is my compassionate attitude actual compassion? Do I only wish this ego gratification of helping? Do I only care about their surface symptoms relief? And all of this kind of boils down to a little bit how I imagine you are as parents. I imagine, you know, it's that sometimes in the immediate, the choices you make for your children, they don't like them. <laughs> They're annoyed by them, but it's for the big picture. And you know it's going to be good for them in the long run for them to eat their vegetables, <laughs> right? But if you're kind of trapped in, oh, I'm being compassionate, I'll give them all the sweets that they love to be compassionate, you know that that's a lesser form of your love. It's a lesser form of your compassion. Just give them a little sweet. I mean, sometimes do that, that's nice, whatever. You don't have to overthink it, but you know how you are when you're in a parent mentality or if you're in a position of leadership. Sometimes the choices you make on behalf of the people you care for, they don't like. But you know it's for the greater good or you know it's for the big picture. So you're robust enough to cope with their resentment, knowing it'll pay off in the long run. Yeah, so when we get self-cherishing, really strong in us we want everyone to like us all the time yeah and a bodhisattva doesn't need people to like them yeah it's irrelevant if people like them of course then that means lots of people like them right but they don't have that neediness and that grasping and that i'll just give you a little samsara symptoms relief to settle you and give you momentary happiness so you'll like me they don't do that they're thinking, what's the deepest way I can provide conditions for your deepest development? So this is just review, but remembering that we're doing two things, either, you know, one at a time or parallel, however you want to view it. But through, through cherishing others, leading to actual bodhicitta and eventually Buddhahood, and then through wisdom, realizing emptiness, leading to ending suffering and its causes altogether. So we're working on method, we're working on wisdom, back and forth, back and forth, eventually simultaneously. And this is where I had the secular framing of understanding the difference between being self-aware and self-conscious. Did that framing make sense to you? I don't know if those English words have tidy Hebrew translations, but sometimes, you know, when you become more familiar with Buddhism, you're more mindful of your body, speech, and mind, and that self-awareness increases. But then sometimes when the self-awareness increases, you're embarrassed about what you see in yourself, and then you start to get self-conscious and defensive and feel, you know, kind of ashamed. So that's not what we're wanting. We're wanting the elevated self-awareness without the cringe about what you find because the self-awareness is supposed to be conditioned with bodhicitta. It's not like a passive mindfulness that just says, I am doing this, I am thinking that. We don't want passive mindfulness with our self-awareness. We want active mindfulness that has an agenda. May I be of benefit to all. So does that make sense that self-aware, not self-conscious?
Yeah, easy. Okay. So the Dogon quote, to know the self is to forget the self. Um, I can't really attempt to give a good Zen commentary because I am not a Zen Buddhist. But there is a way of framing it in a Mahayana Tibetan Buddhist way. And of course, Zen is Mahayana as well. When I'm talking about this quote, the Tibetan Buddhist framing, just to re reinforce it, is that we need to know and then forget the twin demon selves, realize and destroy them, meaning self-cherishing. So we need to know that there is a lack of logic and countless faults of self-cherishing. We come to know that within ourselves and then destroy or quote, forget that self that is cherished in an exaggerated way with indifference to others. That self needs to be forgotten or destroyed because it never existed. Then self-grasping, we have to know that the source of all of our mistaken appearances and reactions is grasping at an inherently existent self, which is a self that does not exist at all. So then we have to know the object of negation and forget it in the sense of stop believing in it. So to know the self is to forget the self reinforces compassion, but we're not talking about neglect and we're not talking about disassociation. We're talking about destroying self-cherishing and self-grasping. The, the beauty of Zen is that it's very poetic, but the frustrating part of Zen is that it often speaks in seeming paradoxes. So, um, Sometimes a new way or a new framework can enliven a conversation we're already having, but it also could confuse it. So if it's making it muddy, just move on from it and come back to what you know about self-cherishing, self-grasping. Okay, so this is from your text, and I hope you guys are reading your text. Um, please do, but uh, for a section is, here's one section about compassion. So in the beginning, before we have the, the Bodhisattva path of accumulation, compassion is like a seed that will grow into all the magnificent qualities of a Buddha. Without compassion, Bodhicitta cannot arise. But when we view the dukkha of ourselves and others with compassion, the strong aspiration to protect all sentient beings from the misery of samsara, and lead them to full awakening will arise. So based on this, we make the strong, vibrant determination to attain the highest awakening, to become a Buddha, in order to lead others to that state. This is Bodhicitta. Seeing that to actualize this aspiration, we need to amass the two collections, meaning method and wisdom, and engage in the six perfections, the chief of which is wisdom, we immerse ourselves in these practices and cultivate non-dual wisdom. In this way, compassion is the root of the other two causes of, bodhi, of a bodhisattva and is the seed that bears the fruit of Buddhahood. So what makes someone into a bodhisattva? How do you become a bodhisattva? The root cause is this great compassion, this personal responsibility to end the suffering of others, and then of course bodhicitta, and of course non-dual wisdom. So a bodhisattva is someone with uncontrived bodhicitta, right? Do you remember when we were talking about the five paths, when we were talking about the Heart Sutra and tenants, the first path is the path of accumulation? Do you remember what is the start of the path of accumulation? What do you need? What two things? these pathway awarenesses. Remember Tayata, Om Gate Gate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhisoha, the Heart Sutra Mantra, talking about the five paths. What's the entry to the first path? Nobody remembers? <laughs> path of accumulation? Path of preparation, path of seeing, path of meditation, path of no more learning, the five paths. The first one, what starts it? It's pathway awareness. 
realization. No? Okay. <laughs> Unfortunate. Go back to those notes. Um, the five paths were the developmental stages of becoming a Buddha, and they were kind of demarcations of realizations along the way, the most significant ones, right? So when we talk about entering the Mahayana path or achieving the path of accumulation, you need uncontrived bodhicitta and you need uncontrived renunciation. So uncontrived means you don't have to force it or think about it or conjure it up. It's there spontaneously. And the way to make it come about spontaneously is by fabricating it and bringing it to your mind again and again and again. It's through repetition that it becomes effortless. Just like practicing a musical instrument in one piece of music, again and again, eventually you don't need to look at the music, you don't even have to think about it, it just flows. So the path of accumulation is when you officially become a bodhisattva. And so when we say the entry is uncontrived renunciation, uncontrived bodhicitta, implicit in that is some understanding of emptiness. Yeah, implicit in that is that you had a great deal of great compassion before that point. Yeah, so when we're talking about the causes of a bodhisattva, just kind of keep that five pathway conversation in your mind. So then a question arises or might arise. First, someone generates bodhicitta and becomes a bodhisattva. Then she trains in the six perfections. Only when she practices the perfection of wisdom does she gain the wisdom free from the two extremes, right? Nihilism and eternalism. So how can non-dual understanding be a cause for a bodhisattva when it is developed after one has already become a bodhisattva, right? So how can you have a non-dual understanding be a, one of the causes of being a bodhisattva if it's only developed later on? So the response is that the non-dual understanding that Chandrakirti refers to here is not an Arya's wisdom directly realizing suchness, meaning it's not yet the path of seeing. It's not yet direct, direct. It's not yet perceptual, not yet. This would be where the appearance of subject and object and the appearance of true existence have totally vanished. So in this case, rather, it is a conceptual realization of emptiness, an understanding of non-duality cultivated by a practitioner with sharp faculties prior to becoming a bodhisattva. This wisdom is non-dual in the sense of being free from the two extremes of absolutism and nihilism. It is an inferential realization of emptiness that has the appearance of subject and object and is not non-dual in that sense. So a very strong understanding of emptiness, but doesn't have to yet be a realization for you to be a bodhisattva. So then shradhakas and solitary realizers, remember these were fundamental vehicle practitioners in the Pali tradition, shravakas being hearers, solitary realizers, we talked about them in our Buddha nature semester. So shravakas and solitary realizers also generate non-dual wisdom, so why is it explicitly mentioned as the cause of bodhisattvas? And the response is, although shravakas and solitary realizers cultivate the same wisdom as bodhisattvas, their spiritual aspiration is different. They seek the personal peace of nirvana. And with strong renunciation of samsara and aspiration to attain liberation, enter the shravaka or solitary realizer vehicles. So what's being said here is that the path of accumulation, the entry to that realization, that pathway awareness for a Mahayana practitioner is bodhicitta and renunciation uncontrived. For a foundational vehicle practitioner like a shravaka or pratyeka buddha, hearers and solitary realizers, their entry is just renunciation. 
So they also have five paths, the same as we do, but their five paths are not qualified by or conditioned with bodhicitta. But they still have renunciation very strongly, and they also have an inferential understanding of non-dual awareness or this wisdom that understands the that's free from the extremes of eternalism and nihilism. So they have the same wisdom, they just don't have the same method. Does that make sense? So what we're talking about here is when you're practicing, who is it for? When you're developing, how expansive is it? Because we could be falling into, I don't want to hurt anyone, I'll help them when I can, but it's kind of passive, I'm just going to get myself out of this mess. And that would be maybe a missed opportunity if we've met the Mahayana path and this altruistic motivation it seems good to continue the momentum of that. And from the very beginning, even before we achieve the five paths, to keep reinforcing what I do for myself, I do for the sake of others. What I do for the sake of others will benefit the self, but my main motivation is the great enlightenment of all sentient beings. And my work will not be done until all sentient beings are free of suffering. If we can keep that from the very beginning, the momentum is going to be a lot more. So just kind of framing to understand. And of course, for us, we say Mahayana practitioners, but it's not like we even have the same altruism as many foundational vehicle practitioners. They might have much better compassion than we do. So we're talking in terms of strategy and aim not necessarily in terms of who we actually are so far as practitioners. This is all kind of aspirational conversation. Okay, so by progressing through the vehicle, <clears throat> through the um, five paths, they attain our hot ship. Some our hots have compassion and the mind wishing to benefit others. And some also have a measurable compassion. However, they have strong yearning for their own nirvana which inhibits their wish to benefit others from being robust and resilient. In the case of bodhisattvas, their realization of emptiness and great compassion complement and assist each other. By realizing emptiness, they gain the direct antidote to the afflictions that cause samsara. Okay, so let's see. Um, here's your follow-up reading, and it will really help if you do your reading, and um, make sure you finish up the Bodhicitta chapter. And the thing to sit with during the day today is to really ask yourself, how does understanding emptiness reinforce compassion? How does having compassion reinforce emptiness? Because they're not two contained separate things they should weave into each other. So just kind of like hold that as an open question. How do method and wisdom complement? Dedicating all sentient beings who although self and all appearances are dharma datu by nature have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well-being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. Okay. So if you have any lingering questions, uh, bring them to Meeting the Dharma, and I'll see you later. Thank you, and see you later.